All right, folks, we got uh, we got Oliver White here with us today. And uh, for anybody that doesn't know who Oliver White is, he's world traveler, fly fisher. He's taken off one continent, one fish at a time. So uh, we're just going to get right into it. Uh, basically, I'd like to know, uh, let's start off with how you get into fly fishing, Oliver. Yeah, sure. David, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I was always... A fisherman as a kid you know I just loved loved it you know my dad wasn't an angler but even as like a little kid I can remember you know taking just a, a bamboo cane pole and a can of corn and catching little horny heads in the creek and so I always had a little bit of the fishing bug and when I was in college is when I really started fly fishing pretty significantly and uh, there was a big you know and I was into all kinds of outdoor sports man climbing and skiing and fishing was part of it and um and I had a skiing accident my junior year in college. I was 19, and I, I broke my back. Uh, I broke three vertebrae, my pelvis, my hip, my sacrum, uh, and was really banged up. I missed a year of school. I was in a back brace and a walker. And, you know, as a, as a young man, that was a really tough place to be. And being stuck in bed was really, really hard. And, uh, you know, the, the mental anguish was as difficult as the physical healing. And, and one of the things I would do is I would go out – literally with a back brace and a walker in my parents yard and cast my fly rod right just as part of therapy is one of the, the few things awesome. that i could could do and so as i healed up and got better and um you know my focus really shifted to fishing and that kind of became the one the one thing that i was doing and so uh you know that was a very transformative moment for me and uh very quickly after that i got a job at a fly shop and started guiding from there and just never stopped Awesome. Well, that's kind of like me, like, I, except I didn't have the tragic story like you. But as a young man, I was 15 years old. I was given the opportunity to start working at a local fly shop. And, uh, you know, my career just gravitated from there. I had real good people around me that, that guided me into, uh, you know, both uh, ethical fishing and uh, as well as fly tying. And, and then that evolved into the commercial fly tying and stuff. And now, you know, as a lot of my viewers know, I'm uh, I'm a professional guide now and commercial fly tire, so I can kind of relate as to getting into it at that early yeah. age. Mine was my grandfather that got me into it uh, for the most part. Uh, I used to, he he didn't exactly approve of me and my cousin stealing his fly rods out of the garage and going down to the lake. He lived right on the lake, so we used to steal the, his fly rods and go down. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we knew that the flies that he had in his leather wallet were the good ones. So if we could get one or two out of his leather wallet without him knowing and we could get the fly rod down there one day that he had to go into town for supplies or something, we could get down on the wharf and we could fish. <laughs> and it was great. But I don't know how he knew, man. I really don't know how he knew. But he knew every time that one of them rods was moved. I guess that's probably because you or I would know if somebody yeah. touched one of our rods. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody touches my stuff, I would know too, for sure. Yeah. But. If somebody took one strip off my reel and reeled it back on, I would know that that's not the way I reeled it back on. So. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think uh, most people, you know, I, I think for most people, you, you know, the, to find fly fishing, it's almost always through a parent or a grandparent, right? And, and it's one of the, one of the important things about the, the space is, you know, bringing in new people and making it a little more open. You know, it's a, there's a big barrier to entry to try to figure it out on your own, right? There's a big knowledge gap there uh, of making it obtainable. And so if your parents aren't into it, it's really hard for kids to get into it. And, and I think the world would be a little better served if, if more kids fished. So I think figuring uh, out how to, how to close that gap would be a good thing. Uh, and, and unfortunately for me, I'm in a situation, my young fella, he's, uh, he's 23, just started to show an interest in fishing with his buddies like two years ago, like bass fishing and stuff. I did have him out fly fishing when he was, uh, when he was younger and stuff. And you know, caught American shad and he's fished for Atlantic salmon, hooked one, never landed it. But I mean, he's been into them and, and stuff like that. But he was always a gamer. Like he, he enjoyed his video games. He enjoyed hanging out with his buddies. And, and everybody always told me, don't pressure them into it because you'll push them away. So I never did that. But I think I probably could have pushed a little harder. Unfortunately, I didn't. Um, I have no regrets. He has no regrets. He doesn't hate me for taking him out, making him sit on the rock when the bugs were so bad that, you know, nobody wanted to be there that was in their right mind. Like <laughs> the salmon fishermen in Newfoundland or Labrador, it takes a special kind of person to actually want to be there after you've 
done it as much as what I have because the bugs are really bad. I'm not sure what they're like in. Uh, I know down in Bahamas they can get quite bad because, uh, you know, I'm, I I've spent quite a bit of time not far from there, which I wouldn't mind touching on uh, a little bit there in our conversation because I know uh, I know we've shared a little bit of a passion of a particular country that uh, tends to be known as forbidden fruit for uh, most Americans. So. Um, Tell me a little bit about uh, how you got started guiding. Like, uh, what really, what really yeah. made you take that jump from, you know, f- casting with your fly rod in the backyard to, geez, I, I really think I got something to offer to people here. Well, yeah, I, 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 that was not not the intent. I actually, uh, I hustled a job at a fly shop. I didn't want to guide. I didn't even want to work at the fly shop. I just wanted a discount on my own gear. Right. So I was, <laughs> I was paying my own way through college. And so I was waiting tables and bartending and I just wanted a little side job at a fly shop to get a pro deal. So, cause I, that's what I wanted to do with my free time. And, uh, and then I liked it. Right. I mean, you start hanging out in places like that and it's really fun. And you, you know, I have some lifelong friends that I met there and, uh, you know, and we had a really good time and, and just being in that environment transitioned into guiding naturally, um, and uh or really kind of just thrust into it i mean we worked for a couple derelict brothers and you know somebody would no show and you get to kind of get thrown out there and try to guide a little bit and uh yeah yeah and uh you know i would love to say it was like some big mission and training and that wasn't the case at all just jumped right in and uh and then ended up enjoying it and then just kept building from there and uh you know one of the things that happened for me early is that uh I, I didn't stay stay home right so i started there in western north carolina where i'm from but uh as soon as i graduated college i got a job in argentina and then i was guiding down in argentina and somebody got me a job in jackson hole wyoming so i left argentina and i drove out west for the first time and uh you know and, and so i immediately started kind of being a nomadic fishing guide and and wasn't really guiding on my home waters per se you know i was just bouncing around a little bit and that kind of translated through the rest of my fishing career right i mean i uh you know i haven't done a great job planting roots i, I love to get out there and i you know go figure something out pretty well and uh you know and then think go find another adventure somewhere oh there's a big world and there's no point in dropping your roots in one spot or uh, or especially as a young man like i got married young uh, uh i met my wife on a on a blind date on my 21st birthday so we just celebrated our 20th year together uh just the other day Congrats. actually so oh, thanks man appreciate that and uh so yeah i didn't get to do the whole travel thing uh i had a family young but i knew young that i wanted to make a living in the fishing industry i knew that i wasn't really cut out for the corporate world i knew that uh you know i didn't want to have to get up and go to the nine to five at a factory or or not that there's anything wrong with those jobs i just knew that i wasn't wired that way i had to be in the outdoors i had to be doing something that i enjoyed doing or i wasn't going to be happy in life and if you're not happy in life you end up with you know all sorts of problems like you know you can end up with you know whatever like you know maybe your marriage will suffer from it or whatever so i knew at a very young age that i wanted to make a living in the woods and on the water and my mother asked me the day that i graduated and it's kind of funny a real good friend of mine from ohio steve madewell who's a great fisherman who worked with metro parks there he basically was one of the guys that helped develop the the steelhead fishery in Ohio. And uh, so anyway, I met this guy in Labrador and he's singer songwriter and he ended up kind of writing this song or I ended up inspiring parts of this song. But when my mom asked me when I was 18, when I graduated high school, what I was going to do, I told her, I said, I I think I'm going to become a professional guy. And she told me, she said, you'll never make a living in the woods. Anyways, I have a tattoo on my chest and this song sings about this tattoo and it's a compass, like an old flip open compass, like the pop or a pocket watch. And uh, north isn't where north should be and south isn't where south should be. And it it says my way and my whole chest is Atlantic Canada where all the Atlantic salmon rivers are for for Canada. So that was kind of my way of saying, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it my way here I am 20 years later, I raised a family. I got a 17 year old daughter and a 23 year old son. So, and I'm still kicking it. So 
it's all that's all that's all we can uh, that's all we can do is just keep keep going, oh, right? Man. COVID's COVID's got us a little bit down as guides right now, especially here in Canada because our borders are closed. At least you guys are, you know, you're free to go pretty much in your country, from what I'm told. But here it's not quite the same. But I don't really want to talk about COVID or any of that stuff at all. But since we're on the topic of family, I hear you got a new member in your family. Tell us a little yep. bit about that. Yeah, uh, you know, we just had uh, our second, so I have two little boys. Uh, Huckleberry's three, and Charlie's a month old. And uh, nice. yeah, certainly, you know, hope to to drag them along on these adventures and get them outside. And um, you, you know, I th and and for me, I I'd like to instill with them the idea that they can make a living outside, right? When you know, unlike you, man, when I, you know, when I finished college, I was guiding, and I, you know, I didn't. I didn't think that I could do that as a profession, right? I, it was always a transitory time in my life. And so, you know, I found myself and I really loved it and was making a good living, but it was always that mentality of when are you going to go get a real job, right? And, uh, um, and, and, I, and I do think that the guiding is an honorable profession. And, and I think that you can make a great living doing this, not just in the quality of life, but, you know, financially as well. And I certainly hope that my boys, you know, realize that there's an opportunity for them to do that if they want. And uh, yeah, I do think it's important not to push them. You know, I think you got to let them find it um, and also expose them to it. Like even with your son, I think you'd be surprised. Uh, you know, all the all the data indicates that it's exposure at a young age and, and they can circle back to it. I mean, who knows as he matures and finds himself as an adult, if he doesn't come back to fly fishing, you know, in his young adulthood, that wouldn't be uncommon. And so it's all about creating experiences for people and, and your kids are the same, I think. Uh, I think we both guided a lot of people that, uh, you know, were in their middle age or, or, or later than that. And, uh, you know, fly fishing for the first time. I think you got a pretty interesting story there about uh, somebody that you guided at one time in uh, Argentina that, uh, that never fly fished before that uh, just happened to buy a, a trip at a dinner and ended yeah. up... Uh, Ended up meeting uh, meeting up with you in uh, the middle of nowhere in Argentina, and uh, tell us uh, uh, just briefly about that, and and then we'll lead into uh, to the Bahamas and uh, what yeah, your kinda, gig is there. <coughs> it kind of goes just to what I was saying of you know I was guiding and you know really never expected that to be a lifelong pursuit or profession, and uh, you know I guided uh, a, a gentleman down in Argentina, and and he asked me to come work for him you know and he ran a hedge fund in new york and so you know it, it wasn't that i wanted to go work for a hedge fund but i i knew i couldn't guide forever and that seemed like a great opportunity so i i quit guiding i was in argentina i was still spending my summers out in jackson hole then so i got back to jackson and there were some books in my house and, and a letter so i you know read the books guided all summer called the guy and moved to new york that fall and spent a couple of years living in the city you know with an office job and you know it was eye-opening and, and learned a lot you know both just you know business acumen and finance and all of that but also just of what i wanted out of life and you know that it was that experience that pushed me back into fishing um really with the aspiration of figuring out how to make a living doing it and uh and that's actually where i made the leap from guiding freshwater to moving to new york and then I, when i left new york is when i moved to the bahamas and that was really you know looking for that opportunity to to grow and and uh and to figure out how to make a living in the fishing space and to be outside and, and doing what i loved um it meant being a little bit more than just a guide and moving into the world of entrepreneurship you know uh built a lodge from scratch you know bought a piece of land uh renovated some buildings kind of created a fishing lodge uh that became abaco lodge um you know and i spent a bunch of years living in the bahamas full time and running this business i mean i met my wife there it's been uh, a really important part of my my life and my, my career and uh you know at one point it, it was named one of the top 10 fishing lodges in the world you know by men's journal which is a pretty pretty high high claim and uh and, and unfortunately was destroyed in a hurricane uh in 2019 and uh you know just the you know kind of post hurricane into covid it, it really hasn't made economic sense to to go and rebuild it but but we'll get it back rebuilt and back on the ground at some point uh, i know you'll get it back for sure and uh i remember back when that was uh kind of first getting off the ground there i and uh i remember talking about 
uh, about this lodge and you made me an offer back then that uh that I'll never forget, man. I will pay that back. To you. I wasn't able to. Uh, I wasn't able to put the cards all together. I tried to get the flights to get down there, but uh, I'll never forget that offer you made me, and I will repay that offer to you. Yes. And uh, we, we we will fish together for Atlantic salmon someday, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to teach me a little bit about bonefish. Um, speaking of bonefish, I know we share a little bit of a passion together uh, about one uh, one particular place, uh, Cuba you've uh, you spent sure. a little bit of time in cuba what uh what can you what can you say is that as an american who probably never thought you would ever see the country uh what's your perspective on it not just the fishing i i mean the whole culture and the way things work and uh you know yeah. versus other places you've traveled yeah I, I mean if it was just the fishing i wouldn't go uh you know part of what makes cuba great is is the whole experience and uh, you know, part of it also is just kind of the forbidden fruit nature. You feel like you're not supposed to go and it's uh, kind of so close. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've i been to Cuba, you know, a dozen times or so. I mean, I've made a bunch of trips there and, uh, you know, at various times when it was harder or, or technically not allowed as an American um, to where it was relatively easy. And, and the big thing, I think, for an American to realize is, the Cubans always have welcomed us. It was never, never the Cubans who said the Americans couldn't come. It was our own government who told us not to go. So, uh, so when you get to Cuba, there, there is really only curiosity. Any Cuban that you meet, um, I speak a little Spanish, not much. And, um, you know, you meet somebody that speaks English, anyone that you can communicate with, they all have family in the States, right? I mean, they all have a connection. So they're all 100%. curious. It was, it was always great, right? I mean, the, the Cuban people were friendly and open and, uh, one of the things I always think about is you walk down downtown Havana and, you know, if you walk downtown really anywhere else in the world, all that street front uh, frontage, that's all retail space, right? That's where you would go in and buy stuff. And Cuba's not like that. You know, people it's live in those homes. Crazy, so you walk down it? the street and you, you're looking at people's houses and, and like and it's all open air. Right? They don't have air conditioning. So the windows are open and the doors are open and then you'll get invited in and they're all so friendly. And you can stop and talk to any one of them. Yeah. Any one of them. It's, it's crazy, the culture down there. And, and I try to like most of my clients that I have uh, that come up with me for Atlantic salmon fishing or striped bass. uh have ne like I've never guided a, an American that's ever been to Cuba. So they're always intrigued with not just the fishing, but they're always intrigued with the culture. Like, what are the people like? And, I'm, and, and it was the same answer I just gave. Like, you could literally walk down the street, stop and talk to anybody of any age. Yeah. And if, if they can't speak, like I've, I've stopped and said, you know, I'm not probably near as diverse in, the, in Spanish as what you are, but... I can stop and like I'm friendly. I'll say hello to some older gentleman that's there smoking a cigar and I'll hola mi hermano, like you know, and and he'll say something. And then I'll you know I can't carry on the conversation, but then he'll go un momento amigo, and he'll call out his grandson yeah. for a translator because this guy wants to know about me. He doesn't want to tell me about him. He wants to know about me or. Or he wants to know like why I'm there or how the fishing is once he, you know, I tell him that I'm a fisherman and he'll tell me that his, you know, his uncle was a fisherman or something. So they really are engaging with, with, with people. And I've never been any place where I felt so safe. Like I could walk down the street. I'm not talking Havana, but any other city that I've been and I've traveled in every, pretty much every city and town in central Cuba now. And I've never once ever felt threatened at yeah. any time of the day so that's kind of nice when you go there especially if you're going on a trip with uh you know people that are unsure or, or maybe even a spouse or something like that but yeah i think uh you know one of the things for people that are planning fishing trips to cuba i would say is you know you're almost doing everything through a, a very select few of outfitters in cuba right it, it, there's not many options right there's kind of a monopoly on all the fishing programs and they've got the fishing park pretty dialed but uh they've insulated you from the culture so they go and they put you up at these all-inclusive resorts or they put you on a boat and you have to really work for that real authentic cuban experience and all the people that i've traveled down there with you know the things that they love the most you know outside of maybe catching a permit you know were was kind of getting away from the hotel and going and have dinner at someone's home and and that's yeah. kind of a little side hustle a lot of these cubans 
families have, you know, where they will invite tourists in. And I mean, we went to one and that, you know, the father and son were playing the guitar. They'd roasted a pig and the food was just great. And you're drinking Cuban rum. And, you know, it was just it, it made the whole trip. Um, but you do have to work for that. Right. I mean, you had yeah, it's not fine. It's that. not presented to you. You got to go out there and explore and take a few risks and, and go and do it. But but that really, really makes the trip. And you get to really get a feeling for what Cuba really is. Yeah. And that's uh, luckily for me now, I've I've made a bunch of trips down there and, and I don't do the resort thing anymore. Like when I get down there, I got I got my guy that picks me up at the airport. I got or I host trips down there, too. So. I got my guy that'll pick you up at the airport. I got the place that we stay in town. I got the restaurants that we go to. The reservations are made. I've made those steps to get not really what I would consider my program, but to try to introduce people to to the whole aspect of uh, of Cuba and and then you know the guiding and and the and the, the fishing aspect of it is done by the Cuban people. All I'm doing is kind of hosting the trip, and you know I'll go fishing. I'm I'm as you know, I'm big into the photography and getting into the videography and stuff like that. So for me, I'll just go and I'll do all that part of it. I'm just happy to be in the sun, having a drink with, uh, with my Cuban friends, like afterwards when we come off the water and stuff. So it's the whole aspect of it for me. I'm kind of like the guide that doesn't have the responsibilities of guiding. And I'm the fisherman that doesn't have the pressure of being up at the bow of the boat all day. I'm just kind of, there's the, make sure everything goes smooth for everybody. And I just, and I enjoy that. And I'm doing that with no pressure because it's a vacation for me too. So that for me, I, I enjoy it. And like I say, I've made all those good contacts down there. So it makes, uh, it makes life a little easier for, for the people that are coming with me. But yeah, there's so, a lot of value in a hosted trip for that reason, right? Like having a host to facilitate and kind of things like that. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of that. Yeah, so. and I know that you host some pretty cool trips too. I know that you've done some cool stuff, uh, you know, in the Amazon jungle and uh, yeah. and stuff like that. And we might touch on that with uh, with, with some of the questions I got later on with uh, some of your favorite things to do. But uh, um, one of the questions I really want to get into is, uh, you know, what's what what are some of the places and some of the things that you've done that hold deepest to your heart in in terms of mostly on the guiding but also on the fishing aspect of it too yeah you know that's kind of changed over time right i mean there was a period of time when it was really all about the really hardcore fishing and and measure your success was measured in kind of size and numbers of fish and that that's not really the case anymore uh you know the things that really resonate with me now are really authentic experiences right and mm -hmm. it's, it's better when the fishing's good but you know, going to Cuba and having dinner in people's homes and going out and chasing permit, that that's a pretty good one, right? Going to the jungle of Guyana and chasing Arapaima and spending time with the indigenous villagers in the way they live and learning these people, right? Those are the those are the things for me that really really get me excited. And um and I, you know, I really like you know, I like the challenge, right? Like I want to go and, and figure it out and you know, you want a little bit of struggle. You know, you don't want it to be easy and uh, so those are the ventures I tend to tend to like the most. Like I like I say to everybody, if you went out and and I out and I keep referring back to Atlantic salmon because I mean that's predominantly what I'm used to. But if you went out every day and caught an Atlantic salmon every day on a dry fly that you went fishing, eventually I think that would get old. Some people would say, "Oh no, it wouldn't," but I don't know, man. I, I I'm like you. I want that challenge, and I guess that's. I guess that's one of the big reasons why I really enjoy fishing migratory fish because, you know, they're not always there. When they are there, they're finicky. And, you know, it's like it's like real fresh run steelhead. Like, I'm not going to say they're easy to catch, but once they've been in the river for a few days or whatever, you know, you you got you to gotta be on your game. You got, you know, your cast got to be and, and, and permit especially they're my nemesis uh but bonefish like you got to be on your game with those things like you you like i've met salmon casters that could cast you know 100 foot fly lines but they can't do it in three false casts or two false casts or you know what i mean they they can't do a 30 foot cast in one false cast with the fly in their hand and i'm going to be the first to say i'm not a saltwater guy like that whole strip set thing i don't know 
what these Cuban guys were saying to me when I wasn't doing it right, but I'm pretty sure I've been called everything that you could be called in Spanish. Because <laughs> the whole strip set thing, like, that's hard to get down for anybody, but like, even like the back ass and stuff like that, there's so much technical side of things in the saltwater game that are different technical ga- things from the freshwater game, such as, like, you know, you're swinging, as you know, but. Um, and they're all complimentary, though, right? I, I'm actually, uh, you know, you'll, you'll become a better freshwater angler. You know, the the saltwater game is a lot of sense of urgency. Like, you're right. I mean, you need to be able to do whatever you can do quickly. Um, accuracy, obviously, is key. You know, casting the wind, casting backhand, right? These are all just basic parts of saltwater fishing, uh, which will certainly improve your freshwater game. And then vice versa, you know, like when I – uh, you know, I used to guide in Tierra del Fuego for Sea Run Browns, which is all swinging, right? And, uh, you know, and th- that was my first exposure to the double hand and, and all those casts. And then I find that I use those techniques all the time. Like, you know, I want to pick up, all, you know, make a long cast in salt water and I want to pick it up. And then you do a little snake roll to aerialize it and, you know, you pick up a lot of line a lot quieter. Um, and so, you, you know, it, it all are good arrows in the quiver just make you a better angler all the way around and it's one of the things i love about doing all these different things is you pull from all of them every time you go somewhere new to figure something out man you're pulling from all these experiences and um and i think i think it makes you a better guide and uh, certainly makes it more interesting for me yeah so uh back to back to the bahamas so you got two lodges in the bahamas is that correct yeah, I mean, Abaco is not functional. And then I have That's another correct. one in South Andros called Bears Lodge, which uh, it's an institution, actually. It's been open since the late 80s. Uh, it was my first saltwater trip. I went there as an angler. Um, and, uh, man, it's been great for a long time. And it was always one of my favorite places. So, yeah, now I'm a partner in that as well. And uh, so it's open awesome. now. Correct. Yeah, it's open, open with COVID. And uh, we actually are completely full right now. People are... Starting nice. to get vaccinated and ready to get out of the house, and uh, the Canadians can't come anymore. You guys aren't allowed to fly, but um, you know it, I mean, people are st- still coming. So no, that's good. No, that's awesome to hear because because uh, I knew that uh, your other lodge had taken quite quite the beating back there with Dorian. So uh, yeah, uh, so tell me what what was one of the biggest influencers in your fishing career like i said mine was my grandfather so who would have inspired you to i guess really go in the direction where you went like i mean a lot of people pick up fly rods as a kid but do you have one person that influenced you like i mean i know for me one thing that influenced me huge was uh brad pitt in a rubber run through it like and then and then, and then from there it evolved to me, okay, starting to read or, cause back then there was no internet. I, I, I'm starting to show my age a little bit now, but, um, but then I started, you know, I picked up this fly fishing magazine and I started reading about like lefty cray and stuff like that. So, and then Lee Wolf, like Lee Wolf was a huge influence here in Atlanta, Canada. So those, those are the kind of influences that had on me who would have maybe yeah, uh, yeah, same. Right, I, I I grew up in the pre-internet days as well, so uh, you know there was a lot of reading. Right, I, I you know, I'm I, when I get into anything, I kind of go all in. So you know, I was reading, re-reading everything there was. Um, but you know, Flip Pallet is a big one, right? You know, he had Walker's Key Chronicles on ESPN back then, and you know, he, I mean. It was, you know, even then, man, it was just like, man, that guy's got it figured out. You know, he just had an aura. And a, he was God, and, man. <laughs> yeah, an attitude. It was doing all this cool stuff and just had such a great demeanor about it all. And, you know, it was traveling all around the world. I mean, that was always, you know, he was just so cool. And, uh, you know, I remember, you know, a, a lot of those early, early books were great. A book that I still give to people is the Curtis Creek Manifesto. You know, it's like an old uh, comic book type thing of fly fishing, right? That was one of the first things that I found. I don't think uh, I've ever seen that. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's called the Curtis Creek Manifesto. It's written like a comic book, and it's an educational (laughs) thing, and I gift it all the time. It's such a great introduction to fly fishing. I think it was written in the 70s. 
Um, you know, Mel Krieger had a had a book called The Essence of Casting in there, right? I mean, that that yeah. book, a lot of that, uh, you know, had great pictures and explanations, and uh, you know that that I mean, I, I really was studying that because I was teaching myself how to cast, and uh, you know, those were the types of things you did to dig in. But yeah, I, I read every magazine, every book, you know, any anything I could find. So. Your, yours was all self kind of taught. You didn't have anybody hands on as an influence. Yeah, not until I started working at a fly shop, right? And so when yep. I started working there in, in Boone, North Carolina, uh, you know, then it was just a, a collection of us. And uh, it was actually, it's pretty amazing. It, you know, at a period there, uh, you, you know, there were, you know, 15 or so people working there. And a lot of them have gone off to be very successful and still in the industry. Uh, you know, Brad Platt and Big John Anderson have a place in Dillon, Montana. Anderson and Platt, they were both there. They helped teach me how to row a boat. Judson Conway has his own business there in Boone. Matt Brewer uh, is one, a really close friend of mine. He's in Montana and, you know, he he helped me start the Guyana program. He's guided all over the world. You know, we were all all there at one time and all have made a living, you know, staying in the fly fishing world. That's awesome. And you've all stayed friends or in contact at least. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's really definitely. cool. Now, is that shop still there? Uh, the building's still there. It was two brothers. One of them recently passed away. Um, and the other one, uh, you know, they don't no longer have a shop or it's really pretty much just a one man shop. So, yeah, that's kind of like uh, the shop that I worked at growing up. It's uh, the business is still there, but the, the, the ownership has changed. The shop has changed locations and the building that used to be there. It was like in the north end of Halifax, it was like great in residential slash commercial area and there was like this little tiny log cabin and it like totally owed a place right and it was there for years it was called frank harley's and then uh and then it's it switched to mike's tackle shop and, and then changed from there but um you know you used to be able to go in there when frank harley owned it you could get you could buy uh worms and minnows you could buy uh hand tied flies you could get chainsaw parts and you could get your lawnmower blade sharpened there like it was a one-stop shop if you were a blue <laughs> if you were a blue collared guy you went there because you could probably have a beer there on a friday afternoon you could certainly fill up the ashtray full of cigarettes and you know he would sharpen your lawnmower blades you could talk about fishing and hunting and all that so that was kind of like a staple in the north end of halifax when uh, actually that was slightly before my time i when I get into the into the game, it was Mike's tackle shop. But I remember all the old stories. But it's a shame because you drive by there now. That building's not there. There was so many memories there, and so many great fishermen that went through that building, and and, and people that worked there. And you know, those memories are just yeah. memories. Now you can never relive them because you can't walk into those shops anymore. And although there's so many shops that you or I've been into since then. There's very few that ever have that same vibe as the first one. Like, you know what I mean? Everything's, it's kind of like mom's mac and cheese. Everyone's got to live up to that one. Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, unfortunately, man, I go in every fly shop, you know, if I'm traveling, I always love to go. They're, they're, they're hard to find and there's not many good ones yeah. left. Man. So, you know, that, that old soul of what it was, uh, you know, it's hard to find. And, and I think, you know, a lot of a lot of this for me is it's hard to fake too, right? And so, you know, people are always asking, "What are you looking for?" And you're always looking for that authenticity, right? And you're looking for that authentic experience. And th those old fly shops, they had that, right? I mean, they had a soul, and uh, yeah. you know, th those are hard to find. So there's not enough yeah. of them anymore, for sure. Uh, and 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 that's that's kind of like the way I try to keep my program uh, for guiding too. Like I don't want to have. I don't want to have the new way of doing things. I want to keep things authentic. I want to incorporate, like Newfoundland has a lot of culture and stuff. So I want to kind of incorporate that in with it. Like, uh, you know, like you go to a lot of places. I, I don't want to just have that sandwich and a, and a can of soda pop for lunch. I want to cook you up something with the, you know, the wood fire and stuff like that on the side of the river. And, you know, so I, I try to keep that as authentic as I can to the traditional way of guiding here in the East Coast and, uh, oh, of Canada. Awesome. So, yeah, I try to keep it that way. And, and, and it most clients really love it. They really find that that's a really highlight of their day, aside from the fishing. Like, that's really something that they look forward to. And, and, and it's usually weather permitting because nobody really enjoys 
you know, sitting down and, and, and trying to relax when it's raining. So, you know, those days you just, you just fish hard, you bite through it. And then, uh, and then on the nice days where it's bluebird sunny day and the fishing's not as good to so take the, you know, you take that hour in the middle of the day and, you know, you give them the, that experience and it gives you a good time to talk about something other than, you know, where they got to put their fly or talking about fishing, you know, you can get to know the person and, and, and know their families and stuff like that. And, and that, that's really where you build a relationship with clients, I find. For sure. And, and where do you find most of the clients are from? I mean, Atlantic Salmon is kind of a, a niche little part of this, the sport. So. It is. It's very niche and, and, and it can be very clicky, too. Um, most of my clients, I, I've been very fortunate. I've met, uh, I've met a lot of guys over the years just guiding in different places. Uh, but my clients come from all over. Like I, I've got a pretty good base of clients now and a lot of repeat business that just keeps coming back which is which is great because you're never you know you're never really searching for those people and and as you know you never really know who you're getting unless you've guided them before so sure and uh but most of mine like i find uh now i'm starting to get a lot of the the steelhead guys like a lot of the guys from the west coast and uh, i got a great following from uh from ohio there's some real great guys there and uh and, and these guys uh you know, these guys are supporting me and, uh, and they're liking what I do and, and, and vice versa. And, and I've been down there fishing with them, like a good friend of mine, uh, Jerry Darkus. And, and I spoke about, uh, Steve Madewell there earlier and, and yeah. Jeff Liskey, Jeff Liskey. I don't know if you know that guy, but I bet uh, Jeff, yeah, yeah, Jeff's, Jeff's a stellar dude. I, uh, I've met Jeff a few times. I was down to cast a Palooza there, uh, a couple of years ago and I was supposed to go last year, but then I drove down two years ago to meet up with him in Pulaski, New York. We were doing uh, a little spade claim there, and I had a booth set up and, uh, you know, kind of promoting my program a little bit. And Jeff and I, we met there, and then we shared a room and stuff. But that guy's a blast. I was actually just talking to him before I uh, before I made this call with you. Yeah. And uh, he's got a new program on the go down there. Uh, not really new, but uh, just uh, took on a big website. He's... Uh, He's got some cool stuff coming out. Him and uh, him and Jerry Darkus. Do you know Jerry? I do not. Jerry Jerry's a great guy from uh, from Cleveland. Uh, uh, big writer and stuff like that. Check him out. Uh, you'll find him on uh, Instagram. Real good guy. Uh, part of the Cleveland Museum Natural History Trope Club and stuff. And these guys are these guys have done some great stuff for the for Steelhead Alley for their fishery down there and. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's where most of my clients are coming from. But I got guys from Florida. Um, I don't get many guys from the Midwest. I don't know, like uh, you know, I don't seem to get many of the guys from like Idaho, Colorado. I don't know. They, I, I guess they're they're kind of used to their their uh, you know their small mountain streams, and they really like their trout fishery. They have a great trout fishery there. I mean, people travel all over the world to go there and fish and. But uh, like, do you got like, do you find you get many people from from the Midwest going to fish in Bahamas? No, you know, the Bahamas it's mainly just geographical, you know, predominantly from the southeast, right, of of, of the United States, man, kind of from Texas to Virginia, then big metropolitan centers, you yeah. know, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, you know, mm -hmm. anywhere where it's easy to travel. You know, I mean, once you kind of get west. Western America, it's like a two day trip to get there. And, you know, that kind of, you know, they tend to go the other way. They'll go to Christmas Island. If you're in California, it's a lot easier to go to Christmas Island than it is to come to the Bahamas, even though I think the, the bone fishing is certainly better in the Bahamas. But. Is it? I was just going to ask you, like, yeah. uh, in, in comparison. Yeah, Have the you... Bahamas really, uh, I mean, there's they're better bone fishing in the world, but not, not anywhere as easy to get to as the bahamas i would say man it's probably the best flats bone fishing there is for the ease of access anywhere on the planet so you know that that's pretty good you know what the bahamas doesn't have is the diversity we have a few permit we have a few tarpon you know but like we don't have the gts or any of the exotic stuff that you'll find in the pacific or the indian ocean uh you know in mexico belize you know cuba though they do much better as a multi-species destination i mean the bahamas and is really a pure bone fishing destination and i kind of think of anything else that you know the permit and the tarp and we catch are, are kind of bonuses um but we are why do you why do you 
why do you think that is? Because I know I know Permit in Cuba has been my nemesis. I've I've only ever hooked two and I lost both, and both of them were absolute tragic stories of how I lost them. It was just they were almost rookie Tell moves, Permit right? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I wrote an article years ago about being cursed with Permit, right? It took me a it took me a long time. It was like everything that could go wrong did for a long time. Hundred so. percent. Yeah, honestly, but, uh, you know, the Bahamas, I, what I, I mean, say, you, it, like Bahamas is like right there and and like Santa Maria, Cuba is, is on the North Shore and it's yeah. it's almost a stone's throw from Bahamas. And and I've been there when the fishing's good and, and the fishing in Santa Maria is can be outstanding for tarpon. And, and, and like you say, just across the way, just across the Bahama Channel, there's very yeah, the Bahama time. Bank there. I, I mean, my place in Andros, man, once you get to that western side of Andros, man, it's not a far hop to get to the north side of Cuba. It is really close. Um, yeah. And yeah, for whatever reason, there in particular, we on the west side, we do find some tarpon, especially uh, kind of as the water warms up in the summertime. Uh, and we see a few permit, too, but, but not a ton. Uh, you know, at Abaco, we started to dial in the permit fishing a little bit more. And really, as I think about it over all these years, Part of it was the bone fishing was so good, we had no reason to go look for anything else, right? So, I mean, the permit fishing there, it got established as we were moving from one bonefish spot to the next. You'd spook a permit, and then you'd spook them in the same spot again, you know, and then you start looking for them, right? And then you start to have some success, and then you think about other areas that are similar to that, and you just keep building and building and growing. And it got to be where at certain times of year— it was consistent that we could go out there and find them and catch them and the permit there are big, um, you know, but, but that being said, by and large, you know, the, the bone fishery of the Bahamas is so productive and so good that you never really need to go out there and look for anything else. And, and the guides, there are a little different, right? I mean, for them, it's, it's a job, you know, very, very few of the Bahamian guides really love fishing like you'll find you know american canadian south african fishing guides you know who, who they're doing it purely for the love of the sport you know in the bahamas is one of the best jobs there is so there's a lot of you know guys that are very good but they're not fishing on their day off right you know i'd go guide 100 days in a row and then go fishing on my day off <laughs> yeah, exactly that, that's not <laughs> happening as much down there so yeah. you know that lack of pursuit on your own uh, i think impacts that a little bit too Right on. So if all this COVID stuff goes away anytime soon, what's your next big adventure? Yeah. So my next big one on the books right now is I'm uh, scheduled to get back to Kamchatka in, in Russia this summer for a couple of weeks, which, you know, ranks as one of my top adventures of all time. And then I'll go down to Bolivia in the fall, chase some Dorado. And then I've got a Seychelles trip booked for the winter. So I've kind of got three starting halfway through the year. Um, right. And, you know, pretty good. You know, I, I used to, you know, now that I'm playing dad, I'm kind of toning down the travel a little bit, but I, I usually try to get, you know, six, eight, 10 trips a year somewhere. Nice. So have you done Seychelles before? Oh yeah. 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 The, the Seychelles yeah. is the best there is. So yeah. It's, I know chances are I'll probably never ever see the Seychelles, but it's, it's, uh, a few years ago, I did a list of uh, 50 things I'd like to do in my life, and not so much a bucket list. It was things that were actually potentially attainable. Anyways, yes. that was on the top three. That's a good one. Of, of, yeah. of, of all the things I could do, like, you know, if, if I could be dropped off on a paradise island with with, with – the most beautiful scenery that you could have with my wife or whatever. Out of all the things I could do, fishing GTs in the Seychelles was on the top three of that whole entire 50s list, right? And uh, I just watched so many videos on the man. Like, I've never actually gotten to talk to somebody that's actually hooked a nice size one. Are they yeah. what it looks like? Yeah, yeah, are, no, they, man, they're back, are, are they? Are they the deal? Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, one, it's attainable, right? You, you can definitely make that happen. So you should, you should keep hammering away on that. There's a way to get there and do that and make that work. You know, host a trip, go do something. But it's, it's worth doing and worth pulling off. 
Um, yeah, and GTs are badass, right? And uh, all the videos you see, those are those are the moments of greatness, right? It's not always oh, like 100%. that. It is like that. And um, and and Menyako has so many of these incredible footage. But one of the things is, you know, you're waiting and you're in, you know, knee deep or just over knee deep water. And they're hyper aggressive. So you're stripping the fly as fast as you can. So you lay out your whole cast and you're stripping as fast as you can, which means the fly is in the very surface of the water column. Right. And these fish, they're big, you know, deep stacked fish like that. You know, their eyes up here and their mouth is down low. So as they come behind the fly, it's like you know, a the up here, they have to elevate in the water column <laughs> to eat it. Right. And so like you man and it all they they will chase right to you so they're almost at the rod tip and like their head will pop out and they look you in the eye and then they eat the fly and then it, then they're badass right yeah if you don't if you don't break them they they will break you for sure wow so, yeah. <laughs> uh have you got uh, have you done any films with them yourself no i've never done any filming in the seychelles right so i uh, always just fishing playing hosting um but uh but yeah maybe maybe yeti should get on that yeah, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see about you know, the, the filmings are always a bonus, right? You know, oftentimes, you know, it's great to capture the imagery of of doing this fun stuff, but it often detracts. Like if you're if you're really filming to make make something, you know, you're fishing for the camera and you're not just fishing, right? So you, you have to make sure yeah, it was it's not quite the same. It's not always as much fun. I agree a hundred percent. And uh, I got a I got a guy that I watch all the time and I follow all the time and the hunting side of things. His name is uh, Billy Moles. He's an Alaskan bighorn sheep guide. This guy films everything. It's, it's authentic and raw. It's, there's no, you know, uh, uh, setting up the shot after the fact or no, uh, doing this or doing that. It's, it's raw footage. And that's, that's the kind of footage I like. Like cinematography is great. If that's what you're sitting down to watch, if you're going to watch the fly fishing film festival, man, you're going to see some nice stuff there. And it's going to be what I consider orgasmic for, for, for guys like us, but yeah. there's something said about that raw footage. And I'm not talking about a guy that straps a GoPro on his chest. I'm just talking about you and I out there. And all of a sudden the school, of uh, GTs come by and I reach in my pocket and I grab my, my cell phone that records in 4k or whatever, you know, I'm holding it and it's like, okay, man, he's going to come. He's coming. He's eating it. He's eating, he's eating it. And it's shaking and stuff like that. And then it's like, oh yeah, like that's the kind of raw footage I like looking at like that there. It, you feel that like you, you feel like, okay, that could be anybody film that it's not like this big film crew. Like, you know, like we've guided and, and I know you have two guided film crews and stuff. And, it's a, it's a lot of work, but B, it takes the authenticity out of it when you see that side of everything. Like, it's great when it's all finished and edited and everything looks good and, and stuff like that. But I do agree. Like, if you're filming for the, if you're fishing for the film, it would take the fun out of it. But there's a lot of people out there that enjoy watching the film for the authenticity and the raw footage of, of trying to portray that in the moment yeah that's you know that's how the early film tours were right I mean, that, the original fly fishing film tour man it it, it it that's what it was and then people just got too good right so yeah. like you just kept so now like everybody that makes it they're professional level stuff but but some of the, the older camera here got cheap <laughs> camera got cheaper and people started seeing it and people are creative you know instagram came out you know all these things and uh you know now the films are all incredible but uh but a lot of them you know originally were, were really raw yeah they were so uh what what new endeavors uh might be yeah. for oliver white you know man i so uh when I left to live in the Bahamas full time, I moved back to North Carolina where I'm from uh, and, and really wasn't ever doing a ton of fishing there. It's just a great place to call home. But I've got a new venture now in Idaho uh, on, the, on the South Fork, you know, it's the South Fork Lodge. So it's about an hour west of Jackson Hole, which is where I kind of started my guiding early on. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty incredible lodge. I mean, the original one was built in the 30s and then it kind of wow. ran 
you know, all through there. And then uh, was bought by Mark Rockefeller in the late 90s and kind of turned into a really fancy high-end lodge and uh, picked it up from there. And, you know, we're in the middle of renovating it now. And it's, uh, it's a world-class river. I mean, it's a tailwater. It's a big river. You know, for most people, it would be the biggest trout river they ever fish. I mean, we'll float this all summer at 18,000 CFS, you know, and it'll drop all the way down to winter flows like it is right now, you know, just under 1,000. But uh, you know, there's six. So for those who fish. don't know, what ri what river is it? For those who it's don't know, it's called the South Fork of the Snake. So, the Snake River comes out of Yellowstone, flows through Jackson Hole, flows into Palisades Reservoir. The South Fork is what comes out of Palisades, and it'll join up with the Henry's Fork, the the famous Henry's Fork, and it'll become the the main snake that uh, from there, and it'll continue on uh, and eventually dump into the Pacific. But uh, but May has a world class trout fishery, great dry fly fishing, great streamer fishing. Uh, we kind of will run kind of May through October and, uh, you know, I'm going to move the whole family here we're going to call the West home. It's a great place to raise little boys. And, um, and it's a, it's a fun gig, man. It's, the projects are fun. Right. Building's fun. So we're in that early stage of, of building and creating, which is, which is my favorite part by far. So you're at the lodge now? I am. Yeah. Your renovations so. going good. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you get kind of handy being a, a fishing guide and working at lodges. So we're in the middle of a big renovation, and it's all good. You know, it's middle of February. You know, we're going to open up in May, and so it'll be tight. You know, which is about what you expect. So are you booked now? Do you have bookings now? Or how's, yeah, how so we'll open up. up. We'll open up in May. We, you know, we have bookings all the way through our season. We we're getting getting full, but still have tons of availability as well. You yeah, know, we have big capacity yep. here. Perfect. I mean, we, you know, we can do 20 boats a day, so we can have 40 anglers. So it's a it's a big operation. And what what are the main species you guys are targeting predominantly? You know, we're trout fishing, so we have you know browns, rainbows, and and, and native cutthroat here. So you know, there's whitefish as well, but they they certainly aren't a target species. Yeah, so. what's the average size of your browns? Yeah, I say your average fish is going to be kind of in that you know 12 to 16 inch range. You know, yep. that's pretty healthy. Um, you know, if you can come spend a few days with us, you're going to catch plenty of fish in the 18 to 20, you know, just as with anywhere, man, once you start breaking 20 inches on a brown, on a trout, any trout, uh, you're doing quite well, but, but, you know, oh, we've yeah. got a handful here for sure. Well, I've, I've got it for years in Labrador and I mean, Labrador is known as the pinnacle for, uh, Brookings, for speckles. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, honestly, man, I've been to some of the best places for brook trout that you could actually be. And I'm not a trope bum, man. I'm a I'm a salmon junkie. Like I was there. I was like I was like the Bohemian. I was the Bohemian in Labrador for trope fishing. I would guide X amount of days, and on my day off, I would sit in camp and, and rejuvenate myself. Like I had, <laughs> I've got no desire. I've got no desire to go catch five pound brookies. Now, if I was going to come down to a place like your place. Uh, it would be to hang out with you and to see what things yep. are like there and stuff like that. But I wouldn't be going for the fishing. I'd be going for the adventure. And, 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 and that, that's what most of my fishing is now. Like you said there earlier, like you're more into the culture and the fishing you're going for the fishing, but it's really secondary. So that's the way I pretty much am now, except for, uh, when I get my day off or from Atlantic salmon guiding, I'm going out. I'm swinging a fly or drifting a big bomber down over a pool, man. <laughs> man, it's funny that you know people. This is part of what makes fly fishing great. Uh, I, I would go chase brookies in Labrador before I'd go chasing Atlantic salmon any day of the week. So, really, Labrador one of my dream trips. I've never done it, so uh, I'd love oh, to go man. see. That. I could probably, I could probably help you with that. I could. I know a couple good spots. We could probably go up there and hang yeah. out and. Uh, and uh, do some cool fishing. So, yeah, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to keep you any longer. We're running on to probably about an hour. Get close to an hour here. So, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're super busy. Uh, I know you got a little, little, little bit of free time this week because the family's over in North Carolina. That's but, right. Uh, yeah. So, so you got a little so. bit of free time this evening. You sit down uh, and have have a have a drink with me there. It was great, and uh, and my viewers get to know you a little bit and. No, Dave, thanks yeah. so much, man. And, man, you've always done a great job of, of reaching out and staying in touch, and I appreciate that and, and look forward to fishing one of these days for sure. So. Yeah, there's not too many people I really stay in touch with uh, that I 
that I consider like uh, I consider you a celebrity. I know you that you're not the type you're not the type of person that that that, that likes that uh, that that badge or label or whatever. But there's not many guys that I reach out to on a constant basis, and I and I think a lot of that is to do with how kind-hearted you are. Like you didn't know me from Adam, you know, six or seven years ago when I added you know, on Facebook when I watched uh, uh, all this. Uh, I watched a documentary on you. It was basically a documentary about. You know all this uh, how you got started with the hedge fund and all that and that's what really intrigued me and that's what made me reach out i was like this guy here he's 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 the real deal he's not uh you know and that and that's i guess why i always reached out to you and stayed in touch and 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 you were always friendly back to me so uh you know that's it's great I, obviously we've we've become friends we've never actually physically met but we we've, we've talked a lot i've gone back a lot of my messages uh, in the recent days just to kind of refresh my memory about things that we've talked about in the past that I might have wanted to touch on here. So like I said, man, I really appreciate you taking the time. I wish you the best of luck in this new endeavor. And I really hope that uh, you get things rebuilt in the Bahamas because that's one that I really want to do with you sometime. And uh, if you're ever looking for a guide, man, I'm always always looking for a winter gig. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, David. Man. You have a great night. All right, man. Take it easy. Let it brother. Be good, man. Yeah, you too.